um, Chief Conley, whenever you're ready. Very good. Hello, and welcome to our Scam Awareness and Fraud Protection Webinar. My name is Joseph Conley. I am the Chief of the Frauds Bureau at the Queens District Attorney's Office, and I will be the moderator for this evening's program. First, we have a few housekeeping items to go over. The chat function has been disabled for security purposes. Please use the question and answer function on your Zoom screen to ask any questions you may have. We will have a dedicated question and answer portion towards the end of the program. We have translation services available for those joining us via Zoom. Please take a moment to move the cursor mouse over your Zoom screen and locate the globe icon. Once you click that icon, you may select your language of preference to activate the translation services. Tonight's program is available in Spanish, Mandarin, and Korean. On behalf of the Office of the District Attorney, I would like to thank Juan Carlos, Elizabeth Bayan, and Jung Juan Choi for providing these services today. And now, before we go further, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing the person responsible for making this evening possible. Someone who cares deeply about the Borough of Queens and has spent much of her distinguished career in public service, working to improve and protect the lives of Queens residents. It is also worth noting, with March being Women's History Month, that she is the first woman elected to serve as the District Attorney of Queens and has dedicated her service to ensuring the safety of more than 2 million people who live, work, and visit this borough all while implementing meaningful changes in the criminal justice system. Please join me in welcoming District Attorney Melinda Katz. Thank you, uh, Chief Connolly. We appreciate everything that you do for the people of Queens County. Uh, first of all, I do want to apologize to everyone that we were a few minutes late, uh, but we are here for such an important, an important uh, scam awareness uh, and fraud protection webinar this evening. I do want to acknowledge uh, Chief Nyberg, who is on here. She is the Chief Assistant um, in the District Attorney's Office, an amazing job uh, that she does after 28 years of experience here at the DA's office. And Colleen Babb, who's the Executive Director um, over Community Engagement. And Chief Connolly, the head of our Frauds Bureau. Uh, I especially want to thank you for all that you do on behalf of this county. Um, thank you also to everyone who helped organize this event, uh, including ADA Christine Burke, the section chief of our elder fraud unit, and the entire community partnerships division um, under, like I said, the leadership um, of Colleen. Uh, now I'd like to highlight some of the important work uh, that our Frauds Bureau does to ensure the safety of everyone who lives, works, and purchases goods and services in, in the County of Queens. Last year, the Frauds Bureau secured more than $2.2 million from defendants who operated illegal tax evading enterprises. That money was returned back to the government and now can be used to fund public services. And just last month, by the way, for those of you that might have missed it, we announced the seizure of more than $1.7 million counterfeit N95 masks. They were falsely and illegally labeled under the 3M brand, and they were sold for profits, profit to take advantage of those who needed the safety the most. Many of those untested masks were being repackaged in a dusty warehouse in Long Island City without any regard for safety or sterilization protocols, putting countless lives at risk. These investigations and the many others that are ongoing are as much a testament to this Bureau's expertise as they are a warning about the proliferation of scam and fraud related activity in the Borough of Queens County. You'll be hearing some statistics later on in the program, but I'm here to emphasize that this office has a zero tolerance policy when it comes to scammers and fraudsters who prey on consumers and they evade legal tax obligations and they do it all to line their own pockets. Prosecutors in my fraud bureaus are especially trained to aid residents of Queens County who are victims of embezzlement, organized theft schemes, pattern commercial burglaries, confidence schemes, trademark counterfeiting, financial and investment scams, and that's just to name um, a few. This bureau also investigates and prosecutes cases that involve cyber crimes, 
including online predatory behavior, and that's against children and adults through the Computer Crime Unit. And under the leadership of ADA Christine Burke, the Elder Fraud Unit has been instrumental in helping our senior citizens who have fallen prey to identity theft, thefts of property, or theft of their hard-earned money. So whether you're dealing with a complicated financial scheme or you're experiencing inappropriate online behavior, or if you think that someone has gained your trust for the purpose of exploitation, we are here to help. And we're not the only ones. Tonight, in addition to the legal experts from my office, you will hear from a number of tax advocates and consumer fraud experts, and you'll learn about how to avoid scams, how to take advantage of free resources, how to report crimes, everything that has taken place or anything that you need help with. I'd like to acknowledge and thank Ms. Brenda Stewart-Luke and Mr. Daryl Tucker from the Internal Revenue Service who are here to help us uh, through these uh, presentations. I'd like to thank Ms. Cindy Katz, uh, no relationship, uh, no relation. Uh, Ms. Cindy Katz from the Queens Legal Services, but we appreciate all the work that she is doing. Ms. Mr. Ms. I'm sorry, Ms. Yan Ki Ang Choi and Ms. Tara Krieger from the City Taxpayer Advocate Office. Ms. Nikki Chang from the City Department of Aging and Ms. Margaret Neri from the State Office of the Taxpayer Rights Advocate. Thank you for being here and thank you for all of your service. Today's panel will provide a lot of useful information on the many resources available to you and to your loved ones. Um, and so I'll allow everyone to get started. I think this is an important forum. Um, and, and just to end uh, my part of this today, uh, you know, our office has investigated a lot of financial crimes and a lot of abuse towards um, people to take their monies, money in very difficult times uh, and under very difficult circumstances. And in a time like COVID, where people aren't out in the street and um, where communication is sometimes limited. You know, the, the guys in my office, the guys and the women in my office, men and women in my office are extremely adapted at getting people's money back and making sure that they stand up for people who need standing up for. And if someone is stealing from you or someone is taking advantage of you, these are the people you want on your side. Uh, so I thank them for the work that they have been doing. Chief Connolly. Thank you, District Attorney Katz. Now we'll be starting tonight's program, which is broken up into three segments. The first segment will focus on identifying some common scams and fraudulent activity. The second segment will provide information on scams related to the tax season. And the third segment will highlight what to do if you are the victim of a scam and how to report fraudulent activity to the proper authorities. Sadly, every year there are nearly 5 million cases of fraudulent activity reported across the country. These criminal schemes cost Americans billions of dollars annually with most of the money never being recovered. We hope this presentation highlights some of the most common schemes, provides resources for people who believe they might be a victim of a scam, and most importantly, brings awareness to a problem that brings financial hardship to millions of Americans every year. It is now my pleasure to introduce an ADA who works tirelessly for the Frauds Bureau of the District Attorney's Office as the Section Chief of the Elder Fraud Unit, trying to help elder victims of fraudulent activity, ADA Christine Burke. Thank you, Joe. Uh, thank you, DA Katz, for providing us with an opportunity to reach out to the community by way of this webinar and share some information that we hope is very valuable to you tonight. We come to you tonight and I speak to you, why? Because scammers have no boundaries. Anyone is fair game, scammers are thieves. They all have one goal in common, and that is to take money or property from an unsuspecting victim. As you sit here and listen to the various types of scams, you might think, well, how am I gonna know if I am a victim of a scam? So I'd like to draw your attention to some signs that are common in no matter what scam is being implemented. You are likely going to be contacted by a stranger or an imposter. They will present their victim with a problem or the promise of a prize. There is always an urgency to act quickly, to keep it quiet, to act alone, to not talk to your family members or a trusted loved one about 
what is happening to you. And almost always there is a specific method by which the scammer is going to ask their victim to provide payment for something. Scams and frauds occur in many different ways. Scammers use the telephone, which is the most common way they target their victims. Imposters over the phone pretend to be family members, government officials, banks, credit card companies, financial institutions, the list goes on and on. They also use the internet. They gain access to emails, pretend to be entities or individuals that we all might be used to receiving emails from. They also use the postal service. A common way to make a first contact with a potential victim of a scam is by way of a mass mailing. They reach out to a victim and with a phone number or an email and that person, because it sounds good, there might be some unsolicited free advice provided in that mailing. And so the victim thinks, why not reach out? Someone's willing to help me. And finally, there are some scammers left out there who are brazen enough to target their victims in person. One way that a scammer targets a person right in front of them is by ringing their doorbell, knocking on their door, wearing a uniform, purporting to be someone from a utility. Once they gain access to the person's home, they can gain all sorts of information from the individual, they can steal things from the location, and worst of all, they could commit violence against the individuals who are in that house. People knock on doors and offer home improvement services, free estimates, and lots of legal advice as to how to help a person that might be facing some difficulties. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about phone scams since they are the most common way in which the fraudster is locating their victim. Scammers make contact over the phone to pull off all sorts of various financial frauds, family and trouble scams, government imposter scams, healthcare fraud, computer tech scams, lottery scams, the list really goes on and on. One phone scam is, that is particularly um, front and center for me in the elder fraud unit is what we refer to as a grandparent scam, also known as a jail bail scam. This scam preys on the hearts and the minds of older adults. It is very possible and likely that when the scammer makes that call, they already know they are likely calling the home of an older adult. The caller pretends to be the grandchild in trouble and says, Grandma, is that you? The woman on the other end of the phone thinks perhaps it's her grandson and she says, Henry, is that you? It doesn't sound like you. Now the scammer has identified they have an older adult who is a grandparent and they've basically hit the jackpot because they know it is very likely this older adult has amassed some savings and will do just about anything for their loved one. The caller then puts another person on the phone who pretends to be an attorney and that individual gives the victim on the phone very strict instructions and, and directions as to how they are going to get that money to help bail out that child that's in trouble. At this point in time, we'd like to play a video for you that was created by Pablo Colon, a radio broadcast executive whose family fell victim to this type of scam. And as a result, he created a public service announcement to try to get the word out about these scams. The Dominican Republic is a DJ 60 some odd years ago. He was the first Dominican actually in the United States to own a radio station. Radio Cumbre has been here for 27 years. We're a family run business. We're a music format, but we really have a very strong community focus. We're probably close to 40% Hispanic here. It was a Saturday morning and I got a phone call from my sister. She had gotten a phone call from someone saying that my brother had gotten into a car accident and hit a kid. 
they needed money to get him out. Not long after that, I'm sitting at my parents' house, and my dad gets a phone call. The person said, hey, Abuelo, it's your favorite grandson. You know, I'm in Manhattan. I got into a car accident. I, you know, I need your help. My nephew lives in Florida. He's a college student. Con artists are very, very good at pretending to be people that they are not. The first thing they do is get you into a state of panic and fear. They don't want you to be thinking very carefully. They'll convince you that your relative is in trouble, somebody that you love is in trouble, and that you can help them. And you can help them by sending money. Don't do it. It's a scam. That got me really upset, you know, and, and that's where, you know, I, you know, I decided, I was like, we've got to come in and do something about this so that other people don't have to do this. What we did was put it in as a news piece during our morning show. We wanted to make the public aware this was happening in our community, that people were getting calls, that the Hispanic community was being targeted. These scams can target very specific communities. So when it's happening to you, chances are it's happening to people you know, people you love. So tell other people about it, warn them. By talking about it, telling these stories, you're helping to protect not just yourself, but your whole community. Pablo did a terrific thing. He shared his story. He shared it far and wide. He got it on the radio. And by doing that, he reached hundreds, thousands of people who were able to hear about this scam. Once you know about the scam, you can avoid it. Another type of scam that is commonly perpetrated on people from all walks of life, as long as they have a computer, is an internet scam, and it is by way of email. Emails appear to be from a familiar entity or a person that you usually receive, receive updates from. It is likely those emails will contain a link that will ask a person to click on the link Upon clicking on the link, you are very often providing that scammer on the other end of the email access to your computer and very often access to any of the information that is contained within your computer. Other types of email scams that we see are technical support scams. Everyone that has a computer likely has purchased some type of antivirus software. These emails pretend to be coming from the manufacturer of that software. They offer a free scan of your computer to make sure the virus software is working. Once again, by clicking on the email or, in, or contacting this, this num the number provided in the email, you are giving access to someone outside into your computer and um, all sorts of things can happen as a result of that. These email scams often um, employ a technique by the fraudsters called spoofing or phishing. It is a fraudulent technique in which these very creative thieves are able to make it look as though the email that you're receiving or perhaps even the text message that you're receiving is coming from an entity you believe is someone you would be doing business with. By way of example, this week, I received a text message from Chase I do my banking with Chase. The text message looked legit. It was similar to one I had received before that said there's fraudulent activity on your account, contact Chase. Instead of it saying contact Chase, it provided a link for me to click on to contact Chase. Of course, I didn't do that. I reached out to Chase through my online banking. I noticed that there was no evidence of fraudulent activity, that Chase had not put any security uh, blocks on my account. And then what I did is um, I went to my browser and I put in the phone number that sent me the text message. And sure enough, within the internet are a number of examples of Chase financial text message scams. So if you're not sure if something is a scam or not, you can put on your own investigative hat and do a little leg legwork on yourself. The internet, while the scammers can use it to deceive us, there is a wealth of information there that can help us avoid falling victim to such a scam. Lotteries and sweepstakes scams are also unfortunately common. Scammers target their victims by telling them they've won a prize. 
And who doesn't want to win a prize, right? Scammers tell the victim that they will deposit their prize earnings into their bank account if the victim provides their bank account information. Of course, the victim is going to have to do something in advance. The scammers are always looking to receive money from their victims. So the scammers tell the victim that in order to receive your prize, you need to send us a payment. You need to pay the taxes on the winnings. And that is how they gain access to either the victim's bank account information or they get money from the victim. So before getting involved in claiming a prize that you have no recollection that you entered a sweepstakes, purchased a raffle ticket, think about what the New York State Lottery tells us. You do have to be, you got to be in it to win it. So if you haven't purchased a ticket, you're likely not the lucky winner of a sweepstakes or a lottery. Homeowners unfortunately fall victim to all types of scams. Scammers show up at people's doors and they send mailings. Many times homeowners face various types of issues. Quite frankly, being a homeowner is, is it can be a problem in and of itself, right? And so people in foreclosure clearly are facing problems. Homeowners are looking for mortgage advice, legal advice. They may have liens or judgments on their property and they don't know what to do about them. Some of these mass mailings offer free legal advice regarding all, all sorts of uh, situations that I just mentioned. You are going to hear during the presentation tonight from various experts in, in, in their fields as to the resources that are available, not only to homeowners, but to seniors and to many, uh, to many of us. Think before you engage in a conversation or a meeting with someone that is offering free advice of any sort. There are very reliable resources out there for you to, to, to engage in, to seek out before replying to one of these free offers. Romance scams are quite common. And in 2019, people reported losing more than $200 million to a romance scam. One example of a romance scam is meeting someone on a dating website. A relationship develops through the course of that website. People get to know each other, even if it is just over over the internet. As that relationship develops, it is quite often that the scammer at some point in time will ask their victim if they can borrow money. If the victim would pay for an air ticket, send them cash so that they come and visit their, their victim. Oftentimes these scammers are all of a sudden plagued with a, a serious illness and they need money for surgery or they need assistance paying off debts so that they can move forward in this relationship. These scammers prey on the isolation and loneliness of individuals. And there are many people that have lost their life savings and sometimes even their homes to these scammers. So now that you've heard about a handful of scams that are quite common, how do you protect yourself from these scammers? So one way, a couple of ways I, that you can protect, that we can each protect ourselves from falling victim to a scammer is not to act immediately, no matter what that scammer, what, no matter what that person, that stranger, that government imposter might be asking us to do. Stop, pause, and take some time to talk to a trusted person about this interaction. Never give your personal information unless you initiated the contact with the entity you are speaking with. So in other words, if you're contacted by what you believe to be your financial institution and they ask for your PIN, they ask for your social security number, your date of birth, any of those items, you can politely decline to give that information to them and reach out directly to your financial institution. If your financial institution is looking for you, they are going to now verify your information with you. And then once they determine they're actually dealing with their customer, you can now engage in a safe conversation. 
never send money in the mail or by wire or in the form of gift cards to a person you do not know or have not met. Do not give access to a stranger to any of your banking account information. When it comes to documents, do not sign a document until you've had an opportunity not only to look at it, but to review it, to understand it. If it is a legitimate document that someone is asking you to sign, they should have no problem providing you with a copy of that so you can take time to read it, process it, and perhaps even consult with someone you know and trust. Never sign a blank document, no matter how long the document might be, and no matter how much you don't wanna spend time filling out an application. Once you sign that document, Anything that a scammer puts on there, you are going to be held responsible for that information. So what happens once you realize you or a loved one in your family has fallen victim to a scam? The first thing, the most important thing perhaps for you to recognize is that you did nothing to deserve this. You are a victim of a crime. The scammer is a thief, they are a criminal, and if the authorities can track them down, we will hold them accountable. So once you know you've been part of a scam, contact your local police precinct. You can contact the FBI Internet Crime Complaint Center at www.ic3.gov. They have recouped lots of money for victims of scams. And not only do they get, have access to resources to reimburse victims of crimes, they, they have been very successful in bringing these organized crime groups, these scammers, whether they're in our country or outside the US, they have brought them to justice. The Federal Trade Commission Consumer Frauds Bureau has a wealth of information regarding scams and fraud and anything and everything valuable to the consumer. You can report a scam or a fraud to them at reportfraud.ftc.gov. You can contact them at 1-888-382-1222. And finally, you can contact us at the Queens County District Attorney's Office. We have a Consumer Frauds Helpline that you can reach at 718-286-6673. And if you or a victim of a scam or a crime are over the age of 60, you can contact the Elder Fraud Unit directly at 718-286-6578. Together, we can make a difference and let's put these scammers out of business. Thanks. I'd like to now hand over the microphone to Nikki Chang from the Department for the Aging, who will provide lots of information and resource, resources that the Department of Aging provides to people. Nikki. Hi, good evening. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here today. And I will quickly talk about, uh, um, I will uh, actually summarize uh, information resources from the New York City Department for the Aging. So can you please share the screen? Okay. Um, the Department for the Aging uh, is actually one of the largest area aging agency in the United States, serving 1.6 million seniors throughout the five world. Next slide, please. And our mission is the New York City Department for the Aging works to eliminate ageism and ensure the dignity and quality of life of diverse old adults and for the support of the caregiver through services, advocacy, and education. Our agency partner with local organization to provide services through old adult centers, naturally occurring retirement community, case management, home care agencies, home delivered meals program, caregiver support program, mental health program, transportation, and much more in each borough. DIFTA also provides volunteer opportunity and has a senior employment unit, an elderly justice center, 
unit, grandparent resource center, foster grandparent program, and more. Next slide, please. Now, old adult center, there are hundreds of old adult center in New York City, and the membership is free and is open to anyone over the age of 60. But because of the pandemic, all of our old adult center are closed, and all of them are providing a health screening over the phone, as well as wellness check, and, all, and some of them are offering a virtual um, classes over this, um, you know, over Zoom or WebEx or telehealth. Um, next slide, please. Now, in-home support, if you happen to be a senior who is homebound, you are unable to visit one of our senior centers, we have case management agency throughout the five boroughs, and there are trained specialists in each of the case management agency that can help you with home delivered meals, home care service, in-home counseling, and access to community resources. They can arrange for friendly visiting and help with managing bill paying tasks. Now, the friendly visiting program um, is actually on hold, like our senior center, until Mayor de Blasio give us the order to reopen and we will resume the opening of senior center as well as friendly visiting program. Next slide, please. Mental health service and uh, friendly visiting, which I already mentioned. Mental health service is geriatric mental health program. It's a Thrive NYC initiative where we place mental health clinician in senior center. Clinicians help old adults with challenging life situation that may cause anxiety or depression and provide private counseling and referral. Um, as of right now, all of the clinicians are offering um, actually virtual assistance to seniors and hopefully when we open the senior center, the senior can physically visit the center for the service. Next slide, please. Now the caregiver support. Caring for someone can be stressful. Recognizing that you are a caregiver is the first step in getting help. Through caregiver support programs, social worker offer information, referral, respite, counseling on long-term care options, and more. You can get help if you're caring for someone over the age of 60 and older with Alzheimer's disease or other dementia or a chronic disease. You can also get help if you're age 55 or older and caring for a relative child or disabled adult. Now, the Department for the Aging also have New York Connects in New York City. New York Connects is a statewide service that helps people of all ages find the right support to fit long-term needs. Community partners provide information referral to old adults and young adults with long-term disability, their caregiver, parents of children with disability, and professional. Next slide, please. Health inf Insurance Information Counseling and Assistance Program. Uh, if you have any question regarding Medicare, HICAP is New York City resource and rely offering resources and reliable information about Medicare Part A, B, C, and D. We have trained counselors who can assist with Medicare Supplemental Insurance, also known as Medigap, Medicare Advantage, and with applying for the extra help program to cover expenses. Now, some of you um, may have heard of the term naturally occurring retirement community, also known as NORC. It is a multi-age housing development or neighborhood that was not originally built for old adults, but is now home to a significant number of them. Supported service and program are available at dozens of NORC, providing residents with health and wellness activities, help with benefits and entitlement, and even more. Next slide, please. The Grandparent Resource Center at the Department for the Aging offer assistance for older adults with primary caregiver responsibility for your grandchild or another younger relative. The Grandparent Resource Center can help you adjust to your role as a kinship caregiver. Grandparent Resource Center service include workshops on legal, budgeting, and other topics. Referrals, peer group pre uh, session, and other services are also available. Now, aside from the Grandparent Resource Center, we also have something, a program called Foster Grandparent Program. The two sound pretty much the same, but it's very different because the Foster Grandparent Program places low-income older adults in community setting where they mentor and care for infants and children with special needs, and we offer a small stipend to the foster grandparent. Next slide, please. 
Senior Employment. The Senior Employment Service Unit prepare unemployed low-income adults age 55 and older for today's job in data processing, customer service, security sales, administration, home care, and more. Participant attend computer, job search, resume writing, and interview classes. Job seekers also get on-the-job training and the opportunity to earn at least a minimum wage. And for tonight, um, uh, web, uh, actually webinar, we would like to let you know that the Department for the Aging has a elderly justice unit that works to protect all the New Yorker from crime and abuse. Elder abuse program are available in each of the borough to provide counseling and support for victims who have suffered physical, emotional, and financial abuse from a trusted person. Now, many of you actually call the Department for the Aging seeking for legal support. Legal support is available for older adults without access to other public or private legal aid. Providers assist with issues that involve public benefit, long-term care, consumer, and landlord-tenant issue. The assigned counsel project is part of our legal support. It is for older adults at risk of being evicted. So if you be leave, you qualify as the judge in the court in charge of your case or visit the help center at the courthouse at the time of your hearing so that your case can be referred to the assigned counsel project at the Department for the Aging. Next slide, please. Transportation. Community-based transportation service is available to older New Yorker um, without access to public transportation to get to medical or social service appointment. Some of you may have used this service, some of you never heard about it, but this is a chance for you to call us and request the service from us. And lastly, volunteer opportunity. If you want to make a difference in the life of any New Yorker or you are an old adult who want to give back, volunteer with the Department for the Aging. Volunteers help in the community with a friendly visiting program, foster grandparent program, and much more. I'm very sorry for the rush, but I know my <laughs> limit and my time limit is uh, pretty, um, you know, set. So thank you so much. If you have any questions, feel free to call us at 212-224-6469, or you can shoot us an email at agingconnect at aging.nyc.gov. Thank you so much. Chief Conley, you're muted. Sorry about that. And now we have a, a video produced by ADA David Chang of our Community Partnership Division depicting a common type of scam call. Thank you for calling the National Tax Help Center. My name is Brandon. How can I help you? Hi, uh, I just got a voicemail from a person named Evelyn saying that I owe some back income taxes. All right, I'd be glad to help you. Uh, Evelyn is left for the day, uh, but I can currently assist you. Uh, for security purposes, I need to verify your name and your date of birth. Sure, my name is David Chang, and my date of birth is January 2nd, 1976. Okay, give me one second, I'm typing that up. Uh, to further verify, I'm going to need your social security. It's a zero five five seven two three two three two. Perfect. Give me some. Give me one second. I'm going to verify that information. Okay. Hi, Mr. Chang. So thank you so much for holding. So 
According to your file, you are on the verge of having a warrant issued for your arrest, and you're facing a possible five years in jail. What? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in order to avoid the warrant and jail term, you would have to make a payment that goes towards your total due amount. Your total due amount is $49,300. Oh, my God. $49,000. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, so, um, uh, I, what, what, what am I supposed to do now? Well, you have to make a payment towards the total due amount. And from there, we can uh, void, your, uh, void the warrant and uh, void any jail time as well. All right. Well, well. How how can I how how can I uh, resolve this problem? Well, uh, this is why we're the National Tax Help Center. Uh, if you make a one-time payment today of uh, three thousand dollars, we can void the warrant for your arrest and void the jail time as well. Wow. Okay. Um, um, and after I pay that, what else do I have to pay later? Well, because once again, we're willing to settle on this. If you just make that one-time payment, we'll void all the uh, back taxes. Really? Wow. So, I mean, if I just pay one time, I, I'm going to be able to avoid, like, the rest of the, the, the debt? Yes. We'll also send you a receipt uh, stating that, you know, you paid off your balance and everything's good. Oh, wow. Okay. All right. So, um, how do I go forward to pay? Well, I just need your bank account and your routing number. And then from there, uh, I'll send you all the information via email and uh, mail to your actual address. All right. So is it from my check uh, or something like that? I'll take it. Yeah, we, we can do the checking account. All right. Um, okay. Here's the routing number. Okay. It's uh, zero two one okay. zero 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 five six. Okay. And the account number is uh, 543-543-22. All right. So I'm going to process that payment now. And it looks like the payment was complete. Um, can I have your email address? Sure. It's uh, David Chang. Okay. At hotmail.com. Perfect. And then the uh, actual address? Oh, um, yeah, 178-77. Okay. All right. 90th Road. 90th Road. Excellent. All right. I'm going to be sending you the mail. It should come to you within uh, three to five days, and then you should also be receiving the receipt via your email. You can call back this number if you have any questions or concerns, okay? Okay. Thank you. So, I mean, we're all good? We're all good. Everything's taken care of. All right. Thank you. Anytime. Take care. Take care, Mr. Chang. And thank you to our uh, community partnership division for that video. I'm now pleased to introduce Brenda Stewart Luke, communications and stakeholder liaison with the Internal Revenue Service, and Daryl Tucker, taxpayer advocate service with, with the Internal Revenue Service, who will be discussing scams related to the tax season. Thank you so much for inviting me here to speak. And today we wanted to share some information that is available that would help you in the pet you know, in the future not to become a victim of scams so we do have a powerpoint that i'd like to share um, with me also today i'm not sure if she's able to come off mute is my manager georgia thomas we have oversight and communication liaison we go out into the various communities and we have oversight in showing you know what taxpayers are partnering with organizations such as yours to help them to show this information to the community. So today I'm gonna to talk briefly about understanding scams and abusive schemes that's out there currently now. Just, what, just like the setting previously, this is something commonly happened. And also if it sounds too good to be true, it's too good to be true. Or if it's scary, or if it sounds very threatening, that is not from the IRS. We are your friends and we are here to help you. So let's turn to the next slide. So what we have is a list of 20, 20, 30 dozen tax schemes. These are some of the schemes that some of you may be aware of, and some of them are already being addressed as of now. One of the schemes which we saw just demonstrated was phishing. 
They have fake charities. Also, people may have received threatening impersonator calls. I'm sure many of you, as well as your loved ones, have received calls where people have said, just like what he was told, if you do not get the money, that you're going to have a lien. There have been times when people have said, I'm coming to your house and I'm going to lock I'm going to lock you up. And a lot of times you've already heard that previously people have lost so much money through putting information on a credit card, putting information on one of these iTunes cards. IRS is not going to call and threaten you. Before you receive any call requesting money from IRS, you're going to see receive a letter advising you of what your responsibility is, also giving you taxpayers' rights. We're not going to threaten you. We want to work with you to help you through the process. So we are not going to call you and make you feel intimidated. Social media scams. Now, social media scams, we may get where people may actually send documents or you may see on the uh, web and they appear to seem like they're coming from IRS, the same way our information is irs.gov, there's irs.com. So there's a lot of material that is invalid or it is a scam. We have EIP or refund theft. Now you might say, what is EIP? That's the economic impact payment or commonly also known currently now is the recovery rebate credit. Now, a lot of people will say, oh, you didn't get the payment. Let me help you. Well, they may say, well, if you give me X amount of money, I will help you through the process of getting it quicker. Because we do know currently now there are a lot of people that might not have received totally the first economic impact payment or the recovery payment. And people are desperately looking for money. The same way you're desperately looking for money, there are organizations that's looking to scan people through the process of telling them they can expedite the process. There's no way they can expedite the process. They have to go through irs.gov. Senior Freud, as previously discussed, scam targeting on non-English speakers. That is really a big problem because now we have individuals coming from another country also, they might not have dealt with the government. So now you have individuals that are saying that, oh, they're explaining about it in their language or they're explaining how they actually can get over or they're charging them a lot of money. We have individuals that help individuals get what's called the ITIN or the Individual Taxpayer Identification Number. And they charge individuals right in their own community thousands of dollars to get this number that's actually free. And also they may tell these individuals, I will help you get your refund quicker. So these are things that IRS is available to show you this is free services that we offer, but you may not know how to do this. But we are here, especially in communications, to work in the community, to actually show individuals, we have leaders in the community, how they can help the individuals that they have service. We have unscrupulous return preparers. Unscrupulous return preparers will tell you, I will help you get your refund quicker. Sometimes they will actually, I would say, hold the individual's tax return or their W-2 hostage in the event that they're not satisfied with the amount of money that they're receiving or the amount that they're charging for the refund, whatever, or they will actually put down a lot of documents or a lot of information that's not true. And ultimately, we want to let people know that is your tax refund. That is your tax return. And when you have a return prepared, ultimately, you are responsible for that return. So it is important for you to sign that and ask questions. So do not go to someone that you're not uncom that you're uncomfortable with. Make sure you ask questions. So they have fake payments or repayment demands. They may say that you owe, just like previously stated, you owe the IRS money. I can help you set up an agreement. However, we're not going to do that. And we have 
where we payroll scams, and we also have ransomware where people will actually hold your computer and information hostage. Next slide. Uh, Ms. Uh, Stuart Luke, I'm sorry to interrupt. If you can just slow down just a little bit for our live oh, interpreters. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So we can go to the next slide. Okay. So here the question comes about how do I recognize an abusive scheme? Well, as it says, typical schemes include promises to eliminate or substantially reduce tax liabilities. A lot of times you may hear information on the radio where they might say, I can help you avoid your liability with the, with the government. They might tell you that you're gonna get free money. And you have a lot of organizations that will tell you if you file through us, you may get, let's say five or $600. A lot of these are scams. A lot of individuals, when they go to have their returns prepared, you may not have a bank account or the person may have not have a bank account. Well, the preparer may say, okay, you don't have a bank account. You can use my bank account. And at the point in time, it might sound good, but ultimately when the refund is due, you do not get your money. And also they have your information. So we have several publications such as publication 3995, which says recognizing illegal tax avoidance scams. Next slide. We have you go to irs.gov, we have a form 14242 where you can actually find out how to report some of these scams because a lot of times individuals may hear of these tax scams and they, they may not know what to do. So you do not have to share it with someone, you actually can download the document and form yourself. And if you hear of these documents or hear of someone doing this, you actually can go about reporting them yourself. And what this document talks about is how to report suspected tax fraud activities, tax scams. It talks about consumer alerts and also if someone's knocking on your door and how you can view your own account information. Next slide. This is an example of the form, how you yourself as a taxpayer can report this suspect. You know, you can also report unscrupulous tax preparers. We have some tax preparers that show up January 1st and they disappear after April 15th. They're like ghost preparers. So, if you find that to be the case and you know and you suspect someone of committing this type of fraud, please feel free to report them. So you're not just helping yourself, you're helping others as well. So on this form, it talks about how you can go to IRS at www.irs.gov forward slash scams. Next slide. Well, this is my information, but what I wanted to share with you again, with so much going on now, and we're living in a time period where everyone is looking for money, but you don't want them to take your money. So it's important that you utilize the material, become familiar with irs.gov, and also look up scams. And also just like previously, uh, the other speaker talked about the Federal Trade Commission. We also encourage individuals when these scams come up, this information can be sent to phishing.gov as well as it can be sent to the Federal Trade Commission. And do not be afraid of the IRS. And if you suspect that someone has used your social security number, please go, go to irs.gov and get a transcript of your account. 
notify IRS. A lot of times when individuals have become a victim of a identity theft also, I think uh, the taxpayer advocate is gonna talk more about that. They never think of contacting the IRS, but realize if you become a victim of identity theft, your information will affect also with your standing with IRS because now that person can create a whole new identity based on your information that you receive. So in conclusion, we're here to help you. And if again, if it sounds too good to be true, it is too good to be true with getting the large refund. And also do not be afraid that they're gonna come there and, and take your last born and threaten you. So we thank you so much and we're here, we are your friends. And I'm here as a representative to let you know that we want to help you. So do not be afraid. Thank you so much. I'd like to turn it back over. I turn it over to Daryl now. Good evening, everyone. My name is Daryl Tucker. I'm the taxpayer advocate with the Manhattan Taxpayer Advocate's Office. Uh, we're an independent organization within the IRS that's essentially we become your voice in dealing with the IRS. And I'd like to thank uh, DA Katz for putting on a, such an important event tonight. And I'm, glad, I'm glad to be here to share some of the information as it relates to scams and identity theft. Uh, the tax Tax related identity theft is an invasive crime that it has significant impact on its victims and the IRS. The IRS has made significant strides in re revamping its identity theft victim assistance procedures, including centralizing its identity theft victim assistance unit, units. However, cyber criminals are continually involving, figuring out more and more creative ways of committing tax related identity theft. Next slide, please. Uh, essentially, uh, these are the things that happen when you become a victim of a scam or identity theft as it relates to your taxes. You, you, it creates anxiety and frustration, infringe on taxpayer rights, causes you economic burden, often results in requests for assistance from the taxpayer advocate service. And it falls under our fundamental codified bill of rights, which is the right to be informed, the right to quality service, and the right to a fair and just tax system. Next slide, please. What is identity theft? Identity theft occurs when someone uses your personal information, such as your name, your social security number, or other identifying information without your permission to commit fraud and other crimes. Um, this is something you certainly need to be aware of. And I'm gonna go through some of the identifying things that you can help to understand if you've become a victim of identity theft. Next slide, please. How do you know if you've been a victim and if your tax records have been affected? affected? Identity th thieves use legitimate taxpayer identities to file tax returns and claim reforms, uh, refunds. The identity theft typically files electronically. They typically file early in the filing season, which began uh, this year on February 12th. And if your return is rejected, it may be because the return has already been filed using the same social security number. Next slide, please. In addition to these additional things that would help you know if you're a victim of, uh, and if your records have been affected, you may receive a letter from the IRS inquiring about a suspicious tax return that you did not file. You've been unable to file your return electronically because of a duplicate social security number. You received a tax transcript in the mail that you did not request. You received an IRS notice saying that an online account has been created in your name and that your existing online account has been accessed or disabled when you took no action. You receive an IRS notice that you owe additional tax, had a refund offset, or had collection actions taken against you for a year in which you did not file a tax return. Or the IRS rec records indicate you've received wages on other income from an employer from who you, whom you did not work for, such as social security benefits reduced or stopped. Next slide, please. 
What to do if you become a victim? This is very important. You cannot do nothing. You must do something. And these items I'm going to go over with you here briefly. You respond immediately to any IRS notice. Call the number provided. Please open the envelope and call the number provided. As Brenda indicated earlier, uh, you would complete IRS form 14039, identity theft affidavit. Uh, you would need a police report or similar statement. Then you're going to contact the IRS Identity Protection Specialized Unit uh, that we commonly refer to as IPSU at 1 800 908 4490. And as indicated earlier from DA Katz and some other folks, you report the identity theft to the Federal Trade Commission. Next slide, please. Uh, in addition, you contact the Social Security Administration, contact the Fraud Department at one of the major credit bureaus experiencing facts of transunion, especially notify your financial institutions, contact your state agency for additional steps to take at the state level. And again, this information is covered in publication 4524 and then also publication 5027, which is identity theft information for taxpayers. Next slide, please. Um, my office, the Taxpayer Advocate Service, works with the IRS to assist identity theft victims. Um, how I, my office gets, gets involved in this, if they, if you have become, if you were a victim of identity theft, chances are it's going to put you in an economic burden of financial hardship. Uh, we will work with you to get that resolved. Taxpayers with systemic burden are referred to the identity protection specialist, specialized unit. So we have more information uh, with regards to this at the link that's shown here. It's www.taxpayeradvocate.irs.gov forward slash get help forward slash identity theft. Uh, and again, the IRS has established a, a centralized ID theft unit to provide assistance to taxpayers that are victims. And again, that number is 800-908-4490. Uh, next slide. All right. When does the Taxpayer Advocate Service get involved? Most cases can and should be resolved through normal IRS channels. I would tell you, we're not operating on the normal IRS channels due to the pandemic. Chances are you being able to contact the IRS has been minimized, but not completely stopped. However, if there's a significant de delay where someone has not gotten back to you from the IRS regarding your matter, uh, and you've tried resolving the problem by following the required steps or following the required forms and still it's not resolved and it's creating a financial hardship, then you need to contact the Taxpayer Advocate Service. Uh, typically, you would go to our website, taxpayeradvocate.irs.gov, or you can call 1-877-777-4778. Um, and we would determine if your case meets the qualifications to be accepted in the Taxpayer Advocate Service. Um, and if it meets the qualifications, we will be assigned a case advocate who will work with you through this process of getting this issue resolved. All right. Next step. Next slide. I'm sorry. And what can you do to protect your records? Always use security software with firewall and antivirus protections, use strong passwords, learn to recognize and avoid phishing emails, threatening calls, text from tax three, text from thieves posing as legitimate organizations such as your bank, credit card companies, and even the IRS. Do not click on links or download attachments from unknown or suspicious email. Uh, this is uh, just some general information for you to take into consideration when you've identified yourself as a possible victim or how to avoid becoming a victim. 
Next slide, please. All right, also in addition to that, you wanna protect your personal information and that, and that of any of your dependents. Don't routinely carry your social security card and make sure your tax records are secure. You review, review your bank statements for fraudulent activity, request a copy of your credit report and review fraudulent activity. And that publication I mentioned earlier, publication 4524 is your security awareness for taxpayers. This is gonna help educate you on how to protect your information. In addition to that, next slide, please. In addition to that, uh, oh, now I'm sorry, go back one, I apologize. Okay, in addition to that, I'm gonna be followed by Ms. Cindy Katz. She's gonna talk about the low income tax clinics and, and how we, they can represent you when you have a controversy with the IRS and provide education and outreach to taxpayers who speak English as a second language. One of, the, one of the other things I wanna share with you, if the IRS fails to get back to you or assist you with your issue as it relates to identity theft or an economic burden, uh, don't be afraid to come to the Taxpayer Advocate Service. All the services that we provide are free absolutely free. It doesn't cost you any money whatsoever. So please reach out to the, us when all these other channels fail and you need that assistance right away. Next slide, please. qualify for our assistance. That's all I get. I have. And again, DA Katz, I really appreciate being here tonight to share this information about the services that the Taxpayer Advocate Service provides to victims of identity thefts and scams. Thank you. And now I'd like to introduce Cindy Katz from the Queens Legal Services. Hi, good evening, everybody, and thank you for having me. Thank you to uh, Queens DA Melinda Katz and her staff for uh, putting the program together this evening. Um, I have some slides. If, um, thank you. So <clears throat> I'm from Queens Legal Services. Uh, Queens Legal Services is um, a free legal services Provider. We were established in the 1960s uh, to uh, service low-income residents of Queens County. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? We have, um, we're part of a larger organization called Legal Services for New York. And Legal Services for New York has offices in every borough. Uh, Queens Legal Services being the Queens uh, Borough Office of uh, Legal Services for New York City. Next slide, please. These are um, the, our practice areas. In Queens, we have about 60 attorneys um, and case handlers, paralegal case handlers, who uh, provide uh, services to the community in these types of cases. So if there's anything here that you see that might benefit you, please contact our office. Um, our intake phone number was on the first slide. It's 917-661-4500. And that's for anyone to call with any kind of legal, any kind of civil legal problem to see if, they're, if they would qualify for help. Um, in our low-income taxpayer clinic, we have uh, two attorneys, myself and another, uh, actually three attorneys, I'm sorry, um, myself and two other attorneys um, who service Queens taxpayers. Um, generally, um, in order to qualify for our services, your um, income has to be below um, 250 of the federal poverty level, 
which in 2021 for a family of four is about $66,000 a year. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, as you saw earlier, um, this is the um, list of um, circumstances or events that may tip you off that uh, you have been a victim of identity theft when it comes to your federal or state. Well, mostly this is federal, but it applies equally uh, state income tax filings. The uh, ones, the, the circumstances that are highlighted in red are the ones that we see most often coming through our office. Um, you go to have your tax returns prepared and the preparer tells you that, um, that they cannot electronically file your return. Um, usually it's because one of the social security numbers on the return, either the taxpayer or a dependent has been used on a, another tax return that has already been filed. And because of that, they won't allow you to file, uh, electronically file your return. Um, so, and then the other a circumstance we most commonly see that we get an IRS notice uh, that says that you owe additional uh, taxes or that your tax refund was taken to, um, was used to offset and pay off a prior tax debt that you may have had, or there are other types of collection actions taken against you. My very first identity theft case that I um, worked on was a client who me um, when her SSI benefits had been um, cut off because they thought she was engaging in work activity and um, her income from work was too high. And the way Social Security got that information was that somebody filed a tax return reporting self-employment cash income to my client's social security number and um, to get a refund through the earned income tax credit and the earnings that they used on the tax return were then reported to social security and my client's so, um, SSI benefits were threatened. So um, we were able to that she was a victim, her SSI benefits continued without interruption, and um, she lived happily ever after. Um, another circumstance under which we see identity theft um, is that um, you receive a letter um, from the social, uh, I'm sorry, from the IRS saying that you have income from a source that was not included in your tax return and they've now included it for you and as a result you owe them money because you didn't have enough taxes withheld from your check. So those are the scenarios that we most commonly see. Um, sometimes our clients don't receive notices because the notices are sent to the address that they lived at when they filed the tax return and they've since moved. So they'll find out about um, being the victim of identity theft when they go to their bank to try and withdraw money and the bank says there's a freeze on your account because the IRS is levying um, your account to pay a tax debt. So that, that's another way that we um, get clients in. But all of these issues, um, the, the main thing is to remain calm um, all of these issues eventually can get resolved, and um, we've been quite successful over the years in helping our clients um, work through the IRS um, to resolve their issues and get 
all the refunds that they're um, entitled to. Um, I know that um, a lot of people mentioned in the comments that they're having problems with the Department of Labor and getting notices that um, they are victims of identity theft in that uh, people are applying for unemployment insurance benefits using their information. And um, it may sound like a new uh, scam uh, because of so many people unemployed right now in the pandemic, but um, I've actually seen this going on for many years where uh, people claim unemployment insurance benefits using another person's identity. Um, and that also can be resolved and I've been successful in resolving those cases. So the, the bottom line is um, always open up the notices that you receive from the IRS and the Department of Labor because the faster you work to resolve these issues, um, the easier it is. The longer you wait to do it, the harder it becomes uh, to, to, uh, to resolve them. So please open up your mail um, right away. Um, it's very common. People uh, don't open up their mail and they come into our office with bags of unopened envelopes from the IRS. Please don't let that be you. Um, yeah, so, um, and call us for help. Reach out to, um, to us to get help. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. If you can't get help from our office or through the taxpayer advocate, um, I highly recommend that you go to the Federal Trade Commission website. And this slide is their identity theft and on um, the Federal Trade Commission identity theft page, they have lots of really good resources um, for you to start documenting the fact that you were the victim of identity theft. I know a lot of people say go to the police and report for crime. Um, we've not had very good uh, experiences when we sent our clients to the police to report that they've been the victim of identity theft. Um, and these, um, the IRS will accept the filing with the Federal Trade Commission. There's an affidavit where you can fill in your name and um, the circumstances under which you think you became a victim of identity theft and um, how you found out that you became a victim. Um, they'll give you a claim number. Um, they'll give you further instructions on how to get free um, copies of your credit reports from the credit reporting agencies. So you can look on them to see if there are any credit card or other debts that um, may have been opened in your name. And you can start working to resolve those issues as well. So I highly recommend that people go to the Federal Trade Commission website and, and utilize those materials. And also call us, 917-661-4500. Citywide, every borough, if you're having a tax problem, it doesn't necessarily have to be involving identity theft or any other legal problems that you saw listed in the, um, in the list of practice areas. If you're experiencing a problem, please call and get help. Thank you. Thank you. And now I would like to introduce Yong Ki Ung Choi and Tara Krieger of the Taxpayer Advocate Office of the New York City Department of Finance. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Sun Kyung Choi, and I'm the New York City Taxpayer Advocate. So my office, we're going to deal with New York City tax scam and fraud issues, okay? And um, I'm going to divide this into two, well, three broad categories. 
So one, dealing with deed fraud for homeowners. Ms. Berg was talking about, you know, how scammers try to scam homeowners out of their homes. And the second issue that we're going to be covering is payment fraud issues relating to city matters. And third topic is unscrupulous landlords. Uh, you know, it concerns rent increase exemption program. So we're going to cover those. So I'm going to be covering deed fraud. Then uh, Tara Krieger is going to cover payment fraud and unscrupulous landlords. And our contact information is at the back end. So it will tell you how to reach us if you have any questions or you are seeking our help. Okay. Um, next slide, please. Okay. So like I said, I'm going to uh, divide in this one into deed fraud. So can you just go to the next slide, please? Deed fraud. So on this one, we are go I'm going to talk about the scenarios, how they come to our office for, as a cases and also how to prevent and how to get help if you are a victim of deed fraud. Okay, next, okay, right there. So like deed fraud happens when a fraudulent deed is recorded against a property. In many cases, the owner may not even be aware that a deed was recorded against their property. So the, I'm gonna give you like three scenarios uh, which the taxpayers came to our office or they would visit the Department of Finance Sheriff's Office regarding defraud. So in this case, scenario one, a taxpayer, an elderly woman, she signed a deed to her house, to her brother, but it was not recorded then. So while she was in a nursing home, scammers approached her and forged her signature on a part of attorney form, then transferred the property to a third party and uh, then, then the, you know, and as a result of this, she had to go and untangle the defraud issues, uh, and it took a while to untangle. It's not a simple process. And in a scenario, sec uh, the second scenario, this is a struggling senior citizen taxpayer who had trouble making mortgage and other payments. So, uh, so, so someone purporting to be an agency contact the taxpayer saying that they could help the taxpayer if she or he could sign over uh, you know, the deed temporarily to them. And the taxpayer agrees. And now the agency owns uh, the property. And in a scenario three, this is already, this taxpayer is already a victim they, of this tax uh, deed fraud. And in this case, the scammer has already got the property. They did not pay tax, the property taxes under this, and they were involved in some uh, protracted litigation. But ultimately, even when it was settled, um, the taxpayer is charges years of back property taxes that there was never, that you know the scammers never paid. Next slide, please. Okay, right here. So, um, so how to prevent? You know, we have sheriff's office, so you could register your deed through our rec recorded document notification program, or you could uh, check city register records under the ACRA system to make sure there are no deeds or mortgages that you're not aware of that's recorded on your property. Uh, and then the, and how to, and also how to prevent. And if you're, if, and ask someone that you trust to look after your property, if you're going to be going away for a long time, and obviously you're not going to let your mail pile up if you're going to be out of town and uh, make sure that the Department of Finance has the correct mailing address for you or the person who should receive notices about your property and contact Department of Finance if you suddenly stop receiving notices from us. And if you suspect any kind of default issues, you need to report it immediately. And we also recommend that in all title transfers and mortgages are recorded as soon as possible and never give personal information to someone that you don't know and never sign a deed or any other document over to someone to whom you do not intend to transfer the title. 
Um, and obviously to get help, you have to act quickly, like other speakers talked about, you just cannot sit on it. If you see a problem, you have to act quickly. And like I mentioned earlier, you, you could report it to our sheriff's department and we could do it. Uh, you could also use online system and file um, your complaint, or you could obviously call by phone 311 or 718. 610-4426, that's our sheriff's uh, office, and or by email, it's, it's at taxcop at finance.nyc.gov. Uh, and, and, you know, and you could always, if you get into the problem, you probably need to have, you probably have to consult with your attorney about the ownership program. And I'm going to move this over to Tara to talk about uh, payment fraud and the land unscrupulous landlord issues. Tara, you want to take over? Yeah, sure. Sure. So payment fraud, uh, we kind of call this this. It was a sort of broad catch-all category when people think they're making payments to the Department of Finance and, right you know, for whatever reason, it, it, it doesn't get there. Uh, uh, we found there are two specific scenarios. These are actually based on real things that uh, cases we came across in our office. Uh, the first one, the first scenario uh, is, is title agency payment fraud. Uh, as uh, some or hopefully some, some of you know, uh, when you transfer title uh, of a property from one owner to the next, um, you have to pay a uh, real property transfer tax, you pay a tax on the person who's, pay, you know, transferring the uh, property and the title agency, you know, can, can do it for you if they, you know, put the account in escrow and sometimes it comes out when you're, you know, making the, in, in the sale, when you're making the sale. So in this particular case, uh, the seller closed on the property and sent money to a title agency to pay the real property transfer tax. And instead of paying, the title agency pocketed the money and did not record the deed. Uh, the sale. So the buyer and seller never received any notices of unpaid taxes because the deed, you know, was never recorded, um, you know, in ACRIS. Um, and, you know, the notice, but the notice was in the, the seller's name, but addressed to the old property. And um, finance uh, sees the buyer's assets upon non-response. Um, and actually in this particular uh, situation, um, uh, eventually what happened was um, the title agency, you know, was involved in multiple fraud. So, uh, you know, the, the law caught up with them and um, the buyer actually had to go to court to pretty much, you know, say, yes, title is in my name. And, um, you know, we were able to contact our land records division um, who recognized there was uh, clearly fraudulent activity and were able to abate the penalties and interest from the, uh, the unpaid taxes. Um, but you know, that, that doesn't always happen, but we, we, we were able to do it because they, they came to us with the situation. Um, but, uh, you know, in, in general, um, I'll explain to you, uh, what, what is the other route in a sec. Uh, and then the other scenario, um, is when, you know, taxpayer, uh, pays a property tax, you know, by check and it's cashed but it's you know, not in finances records for whatever reason. And it turns out that the payment has been intercepted and cashed on, on the way to the Department of Finance by a third party. Uh, and this was actually uh, two cases uh, happened this, this way. Uh, they contacted their bank immediately. Sometimes banks have insurance, um, but they also uh, did this. They reached out to the sheriff. Uh, that is anytime there's any sort of fraud of payment or anything, um, you know, you can contact the sheriff, uh, whether it's you or whether it's a third party. Uh, I mean, the problem with payments, some, sometimes if they reach out to us, we can work on, you know, see if we can abate any interest or penalties, but often interest because it's actually the law. It's not, you can't abate it, unfortunately. Um, but at least you can reach out to the, you know, to the sheriffs that, that call either fill out that form or call the tax evasion and property tax fraud hotline, which is on the screen, or uh, reach out to them by mail. Um, 
So some of the guidelines when you're reporting tax evasion or, or property tax fraud, uh, and again, you know, if you know about this or you know, if it's you or a friend or anybody, um, make sure you report uh, what tax violations you suspect are going on. Um, is the suspect involved in any other criminal activities? Uh, provide as much identifying information as possible, including the full name of the suspect, uh, the suspect's home address and phone number, if you know it, uh, mar suspect's marital status and name of spouse, if you know it, uh, the suspect's bank name, address, and account numbers, uh, the suspect's employment information, the business, its profession or job title, the length of time of the business, the social security, federal identification number, or, or, uh, or the you know, business EIN, and uh, if the suspect owns any vehicles, report their car, the license plate number, the make, model, year, color, uh, locations you kept overnight. Uh, and if some information is not available, uh, make sure you uh, just report the claim anyway. You, if, if you have any information uh, that can help, uh, you know they'll the, 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 they'll investigate, and, the, um, and that will. Uh, you know, at least it'll get reported. So that's how you, any fraud or anything is, um, this is the way you would report it. Uh, I, so, uh, and the, the last, next slide. So the last topic we wanna to talk about is um, unscrupulous landlords. So landlords cannot use a lease or lease renewal uh, to take advantage of a tenant. So if you feel your landlord is pressuring you to change the terms of your lease, add family members to your lease, or agree to rents above the legal limit, or is violating your rights in some other way, you have a right to file a complaint with the New York State Division of Housing and Community Renewal. Uh, the landlord uh, may face some sort of stiff penalties. So we're gonna have a couple scenarios here. Uh, these deal because the New York City Office of the Taxpayer Advocate deals with the rent freeze program, which when a tenant is in a rent regulated building and they make uh, below a certain income uh, and certain percentage of the rent, uh, they can apply to have their rent frozen at that level so it won't go up. So, uh, and as a result, the uh, the landlord gets a credit for the difference in rent and finance. So in this particular scenario, uh, what happened was is that the Department of Finance checked out a landlord regarding a tenant who had not renewed their uh, senior citizen rent increase exemption, it's the rent freeze, uh, if they had not renewed these benefits properly. The landlord said that the tenant moved when in reality they are temporarily away, uh, such as hospitalized or in a nursing home or maybe they're just not immediately reachable. Department of Finance revokes the, the rent freeze benefit based on the landlord's information and raises their rent. The tenant doesn't realize the revocation and continues paying the frozen rent and the landlord evicts the tenant for non-payment of rent in order to rent it out at a higher amount. Another example, the landlords provide tenants with renewal leases with legal rent amounts differing from their frozen rent and threatened immediate eviction action if the tenants do not agree, uh, even though they actually have a six month grace period uh, between renewal of their lease and renewal of the uh, rent freeze program. Um, and the tenant is so scared that they're actually going to be evicted that they just sign on whatever the amount is, regardless if it's the, the rent is legal uh, within what they can do. Uh, other things landlords can't do uh, that you know these unscrupulous landlords may do. Uh, landlords cannot change the terms of a lease while it is in effect without the tenant's consent. They can't disclaim a tenant's right to sue if the landlord's negligence caused injury. They can't make a tenant give up their right to a jury trial. They can't make a tenant agree they will take their household furniture if they don't pay rent. They can't end any discounts on rent if the tenant does not pay on time, uh, other than by charging a 5% late fee, or based on any other uh, actions that the tenant takes, such as making electronic payment. They can't restrict a tenant from subleasing their property, even though it 
could affect uh, tenants participation in the rent freeze program. They can't restrict the number of tenants or the specific tenants li living on the property except to comply with legal overcrowding standards. And they can't charge a tenant extra beyond the legal rent plus the security deposit for preference in renting out a vacant apartment, such as you know, when an apartment's available and you, know, you want it and they say, we'll charge me extra and we'll pay you right now. So if any of these terms appear in the lease, they are unenforceable. Uh, additionally, landlords cannot evict a tenant and move in themselves or their family if the tenant pays rent on time and either the tenant was not giving notice 90 to 150 days before the lease is up for renewal, if the tenant is at least 60 years old, if the tenant is disabled, or if the tenant has lived in their apartment for at least 20 years. Those are terms under which the, ten the landlord cannot evict the tenant under rent controlled properties. Under rent stabilized properties, uh, the landlord at least has to find the tenant similar or a better apartment at the same rent or less, but they have to at least do that. They can't just throw them on the street. Landlords can also not evict a rent controlled tenant without applying to the uh, New York State Department of Housing and uh, Community Renewal. Uh, next slide. So how do I get help against ruthless landlords? Well, as we said, you contact the New York State Homes and Community Renewal. That's the umbrella organization under which the Department of Housing and Community Renewal are under. Uh, specifically, there is a tenant protection unit. Here's some of the uh, executive office, the headquarters. You can find this all. There are several addresses on their website, hcr.ny.gov. Uh, if you need information about rent, you can contact the Rent Guidelines Board. Uh, or you can contact within the Office of the Taxpayer Advocate, the Senior Citizen Rent Increase Exemption Ombuds or the Disabled Rent Increase Exemption Ombuds person. They are within the Office of the Taxpayer Advocate and their contact information is there. Uh, next slide. And lastly, uh, as well, here are some free legal resources for, for you know, in the event that you, know, you need further assistance. Uh, legal services in New York. Um, they have one in each borough, uh, the city bar, uh, the New York Legal Assistance Group, um, JASA specifically specializes in justice for the elderly. Her justice is uh, for women. Um, and then there are other law firms offering pro bono assistance that you can find at that particular address. And then the center of New York City neighborhoods that often helps uh, with things like foreclosures. And lastly, I think is our okay, right. One more slide, yeah. And then this is our information: the Office of the Taxpayer Advocate. In the event you have any questions or you know encounter anything with regard to uh, your rent increase exemption problems or um, you know deed fraud or any tax issues, uh, property or business tax issues, it's how you can contact us. So that's it. Okay, well, thank you to all of our presenters. I believe we have a couple of questions uh, that are outstanding in the chat function. I'll leave it to 88 Burke to answer the first question who's indicated. Uh, if the rest of our presenters could look at the chat and see if they'd like to answer any of these outstanding questions, uh, I'd appreciate that, thank you. Sure, thanks Joe. The question is, can the Queens DA's office give some recent examples of prosecutions where elderly people were the victims? Uh, one relatively recent conviction that this office obtained involved a jail bail scam where the courier picked up a package in Queens County. The courier produced a fake driver's license so that um, he could receive the package. The package was filled with cash sent from a grandparent in California, and that individual was successfully tried and convicted of felonies relating to his role in the grandparent scam. A real estate conviction um, in the last um, pre-COVID involved a deed fraud scheme that was perpetrated by a group of individuals. A number of the victims happened to be seniors. The uh, end result of that 
investigation and prosecution resulted in the returning of deeds to approximately eight individuals who had been scammed out of their deed. Uh, in addition, uh, some restitution was obtained as part of a plea bargain. We have a number of people facing charges right now wherein the victims are elderly, uh, specifically a home health aide uh, who has been arrested for stealing money from the elderly victim's home while working there. A nursing home director uh, has been charged with a crime accessing the elderly victim's uh, personal information that is a credit card while working in the nursing home and using that credit card. Uh, and there are unfortunately many, many prosecutions pending now involving elderly victims of grandparent scams. Okay, thank you, Chris. Appreciate that. Uh, I believe Anna has put up some contact information for everybody who presented tonight. I think one of the key takeaways is, is that if you believe somebody is trying to scam you, time is your friend. It is not the friend of the scammer or the fraudster. They will try to instill that sense of urgency. So please take a pause, do some research as you heard. The internet can be your friend when trying to research these scams. A lot of them are uh, very popular and people have posted about them. So you will find more information online. Uh, if you have been the victim of a scam though, time is not your friend. Please report it as soon as possible. Uh, recovering money is very difficult in these scenarios. However, if you report quickly, there may be some chance of getting some money back. The more time that goes on, that greatly diminishes. So again, please consider reporting as soon as possible. I believe that answers most of the questions that we've had uh, in the chat function. Is there anything else that's outstanding? There is a question from a participant asking if they were a victim of identity theft and froze their credit, they, uh, even though they put a freeze on their credit, their social security was still used and, to file a return with the IRS. So the question is uh, what, can, what if anything can be done about that? And with regard to the IRS, um, is a freeze on account, does that not have an impact on the use of a social security number? in filing a return? Well, the victim has to uh, basically f uh, complete the form 14039 to ident identify themselves as a victim of identity theft. In addition to that, they need to call the 800 number that I presented earlier. I gave it out twice. That's to the t tax peer advocates, um, I'm, I'm sorry, the IRS uh, identity theft unit, they can call them. They also are gonna need a police report and another item I mentioned earlier. So if they can get that done and they can contact the IRS and so that they can get their account marked as, uh, as an identity theft victim, then the process starts with the IRS to do what they need to do. And if they run into a roadblock with that, then they need to come to the taxpayer advocate service, but they still have to do those minimum steps, such as a police report, complete the um, form 14039 to uh, submit that to the IRS as well. And this is Brenda. I just wanted to add this year for the first time, a person does not have to be a victim of identity theft to actually have the PIN number put on their account. So this would prevent future uh, identity thefts happening, identity thieves, you know, attacking your account. So if you go to irs.gov website, or we would forward the information, it would talk about how you could go about having the identity theft or ID pen put on your account so that you will not become a victim. So again, like repeating, you do not have to be a victim, but this will prevent you from becoming a victim by putting it on your account. Thank you. Well, um, hi, I, I'd also like to respond um, to this particular question. Um, this is Cindy Katz from Queens Legal Services. Um, the filing the, F, the uh, um, identity theft affidavit with the Federal Trade Commission will not um, stop the IRS from accepting a tax return filed with your social security number. 
because the IRS is assuming that that is a correct, valid return when they receive it. Um, so, um, so one does not necessarily affect the other in that way. But if you know you're a victim of identity theft through um, having somebody file a return for you, then resolving that issue with the IRS becomes a little bit easier if you then fill out the FTC um, identity theft affidavit. Um, so don't think that filling out the affidavit it, um, is going to prevent you from becoming a victim of identity theft. That's not the way it works. It helps you resolve those issues after the fact. And if you um, want help, you can try calling our office um, and seeing if we can help you um, resolve the identity theft issue with the IRS. Again, our phone number is 917-661-4500. Thank you. If a person uh, has a concern that their identity theft has been um, compromised, you are entitled to a free credit report from every one of the, free, uh, the major credit reporting agencies. So you can reach out to them get yourself a credit report and look to see if your identity has been compromised. There's also a question regarding a deed lock. Um, would one of the folks that spoke about deed fraud like to speak to that or the, um, the ability to, to receive notifications through the Department of Finance? Uh, um, actually, yeah, you can there is a way to actually register for notifications uh, with the Department of Finance um, when you are in a situation uh, where, you know, so you can actually receive uh, information about if someone registers uh, a property uh, that's, you know, someone, someone registers a document that's not in your uh, name specifically, um, or if something looks a little suspicious, it's, uh, let me see if I can pull up the exact address. I don't want it here. Okay, so the The actual website is, am I allowed to type it in here? I think I can, right? Yeah. So basically it's, um, if you go to, Tara, it's on the slide deck. Ours is it, is it actually, number six is it actually, that I got don't taken know. out. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, that's so why that's you what could I'm just cut and from. paste it. Yeah, yes. exactly. Okay. So basically, it's called the Recording Document Notification Program. It's a free. Uh, basically a free, like I said, it's a free notification. So you can essentially see if someone, you know, something, someone registered something that's not in your name. Uh, you'll get an email. I think it's like literally within a day. Um, the one caveat to that is the fact that if you live in Staten Island, um, you can't register through there because it's really just through ACRIS, which is, uh, records the documents for, uh, you know, the four other boroughs. So um, if it's Staten Island, uh, you actually have to visit the office of the Richmond County Clerk to view documents. Uh, so, um, and all email confirmations will come from... Uh, uh, Stat, uh, Tara? Uh, yeah, right, yeah. Uh, all all email Staten confirmations Island? will come from that, yes. 
Yeah, for Staten That's Island, right. can yeah. you give the Rich Richmond County Clerk's number? It's yeah. on the previous slide. Yes, back. I see so, it. Thank you. Uh -huh. So the Richmond County Clerk's number is. Uh, So. Okay, I think that answers all the yeah. questions that we have. I would like to thank everyone for their participation. Thank our community partnership division for organizing this event. Uh, and thank everyone for tuning in. We hope uh, that you got some great information out of today. Thanks everyone, have a great night. Thank you. Thank you.